Let's take a look at an actual graphics interpretation example. Remember, on the graphics interpretation questions of the integrated reasoning section of the GMAT, these question types will test your ability to process graphs of some sort. In this example, we'll look at together. It's a scatter plot in which each dot represents a data point. In order to reveal our answer choices, we have to use the drop down menus and then eventually select our answer choices from the drop down menus. And each individual graphics interpretation question will have two of these statements with two drop down menus that we'll have to answer. And in order to get this question correctly, or get this question correct, we've got to answer both of these statements correctly. There's no partial credit. Let's look at this example now. When this question pops up on test day, a lot of test takers will make a simple mistake. They'll immediately turn their attention to these statements and ignore the graph initially. We actually want to make sure we take some key pieces of information away from this graph before moving on to the statements. Always start by reading the title of the graph. This gives you a general idea of what is being studied or represented, what data is being represented in this graph. Next, turn your attention to the axes. What is being plotted against what? The x-axis or the horizontal axis represents the number of workers per supervisor, while the y-axis or the vertical axis is the per worker daily production. Also pay attention to the scale of both axes. Note both the x and y axis start at, uh, starts at zero, but the x axis increases in increments of 20, whereas the y axis increases in increments of 50. Sometimes this difference in scale can play a huge, uh, can have a huge impact in terms of making sure uh, you get the right answer for the statements. Next, look at the data. Don't get sucked in by it, don't get bogged down by it, but rather see if there's any general trend you can recognize. And in this case, we've got a curve of some sort, not like a perfect bell curve, but definitely a curve. And the peak of that curve occurs around 100, somewhere around right here. So that seems to be the ideal number of workers per supervisor. Now that we've examined this, let's look at our first statement. In the first statement, a certain factory has 115 workers per supervisor, and they want to increase productivity. Once you hit 115, you've actually passed the peak and any, adding any more workers per supervisor would only decrease the productivity according to the trends of this scatter plot. Let's reveal our answer choices. When we reveal our answer choices, we can see that the first answer choice is we should add more workers. Well, we already said that if we're at 115 and we add any more workers, we're only going to see a decrease in productivity. So we know it can't be answer choice A. Let's go on to the next answer choice having the number of supervisors. When you have the number of supervisors, you're actually going to double the number of workers per supervisor. So if we're at 115 and we're going to double this, we're going to end up with a number way bigger, way down the productivity line. So we know this is not going to be the right answer as well. Let's move on to our third answer choice. Doubling the number of supervisors. By doubling the number of supervisors, you actually have the number of workers per supervisor. It cuts the number of workers per supervisor in half. So if we're at 115, half of 115 is 57 and a half. And it's about right here. And we can see reducing the number of workers that much actually has an adverse effect on productivity and decreases it from where this factory currently is. So it can't be the third answer choice. At this point, we can confidently mark the fourth answer choice, but let's see if it confirms our, uh, our, what we've recognized as the general trends of this graph. It says it wants to reduce the number of workers by 25%. So all we know is we're going to reduce this number of workers by a little bit, by a quarter. That's actually going to look very promising. If we go and do the math, we can see that the company, by reducing by 25%, would end up with about 87 or so employees, somewhere along the lines of here. And it does exactly the effect we want. That would raise the productivity. Once you've eliminated the first three answer choices, and you can see the fourth answer choice is reduce the number of workers by a little bit, by a quarter, you can confidently see without doing the math in this case that that's the correct answer choice given the other three possible options. So we can mark that as our answer 
And now turn our attention to the second statement. In the second statement, it's saying, based on this data again, if the factory were to employ 20 workers per supervisor, then that would likely have some effect on the productivity compared to if they were to employ 160 workers per supervisor. So 20, which is over here, versus 160. Neither of these are on the graph. Let's see what kind of comparison we're trying to make. We want to know if 20 workers per supervisor would be more, less, or equally productive than uh, as 160 workers per supervisor. So let's examine this. 20 versus 160. We know the peak is at about 100. What's important to spot is that while we do have a curve, it's not a perfect curve. Because look at 40 versus 140. They seem to be at the exact same spot. Yet 40 is 60 away from the ideal 100, whereas 140 is only 40 away. So it looks like once you get too many workers, the productivity starts to decline way more rapidly. So if we just think about it like that, then the fact is, going to 160 versus going to 20, 160 would probably dip down substantially more than going down to 20 workers per supervisor. Once we recognize that trend, we can say then the productivity for 20 workers per supervisor would likely be more productive than if the factory would employ 160 workers per supervisor. Remember when working with these integrated reasoning graphics interpretation questions, it's really important to first always start by getting the gist of the graph and jot down the important points on your noteboard. Look at the title of the graph. Look at the uh, labels on both the X and the Y axis. Pay attention to the scales and then spend a little bit of time, not a whole lot of time, trying to look and analyze every piece of information in the graph, but rather to spot any general trends. And two, take a look at your answer choices when you're trying to figure out how you're going to approach the question. But don't let the answer choices distract you in terms of actually solving the problem. The answer choices are a hint in terms of what you should be looking for in order to answer the question correctly. But they shouldn't be your sole focus.